Chapter 60, a few things we need to know about ear and hearing disorders. So, occasionally foreign bodies can get into our external ear canal. Um, most small objects can be flushed from the ear by gentle irrigation if the tympanic membrane is intact. Now, if the tympanic membrane has ruptured or if a patient has tubes in their ears, um, they need to wear earplugs because you don't want anything being flushed into the ear. But if foreign bodies get into the external ear canal, a flashlight can draw out insects. I know that's pretty gross. One time in our ER, we had a big beetle about three inches long that crawled out because we put a flashlight to his ear and that big old bug climbed out of the patient's ear. Pretty gross, but it happens. I mean, I think I would feel it, but I don't know. Maybe they're out on drugs or something. But um, also, if you put a little mineral oil, if you suspect an insect, even a small one, um, if you suspect an insect in your ear, you could put a few drops of mineral oil, again, tympanic membrane intact, a uh, few drops of mineral oil, and that can kill the insect, especially the small ones, because they can't move in that oil. So impacted cerumen or earwax is one of the most common causes of obstruction, um, and it can cause tendonitis or ringing of the ears. Good thing to know that word ringing of the ears. In fact, at the beginning of this chapter, there's several key terms that are important that we're going to be going over, but I want you to take note of the tendonitis, which is ringing in the ears, the ototoxicity, presbycusis, tympanic membrane I just mentioned, and vertigo. Those are several things that are going to be uh, popping up in our ear disorders. So the nursing care for impacted cerumen or earwax would be some eardrops to soften the cerumen. Now your physician can order those eardrops. There are some over the counter. Um, they usually have to be held about 20 minutes to soften that cerumen and then hopefully you can just irrigate that wax out. Doesn't always work the first time. Might have to do it a couple times. Next thing is infection and inflammation. So we've probably heard of or external otitis or swimmer's ear. Uh, that's an infection or inflammation of the lining of the external canal. It could be due to cleaning or scratching ear, your ear with uh, sharp objects, even a Q-tip. My mom used to take a hairpin. I think I had mentioned that in the chapters earlier. Uh, signs and symptoms of the otitis external would be pain when the auricle, which is the top of the ear, is pulled on. Medical treatment can be corticosteroid drops. Always remember throughout all of our chapters what we've talked about steroids. They're anti-inflammatory. So these cortisone or corticosteroid drops um, can decrease the inflammation unless it's a fungal inf infection and then that is contraindicated because that can encourage the growth of fungus. So it's important to know where you've been if you're swimming. Uh, was it a lake? Was it a swimming pool? So know your surroundings. Uh, nursing care would be using drops something to uh, calm that inflammation. And remember, eardrops should always be at room temperature. If they're too cold, they can cause vertigo, tendonitis. So um, always use them at room temperature. Otitis media. I'm sure we've all encompassed that at one time or another. So that's infection of the middle ear. And it can occur with the colds because the fluid builds up and it leads to a blockage of the eustachian tubes. And then that causes pain and pressure on the tympanic membrane. In fact, if you take your child to the doctor, um, they could say that tympanic membrane is caving inwards. And in other words, it's starting getting ready to rupture. 
or maybe it has ruptured, or maybe it's just red. They'll say the eardrum is red. Uh, chronic otitis media can lead to hearing loss and drainage, and also that hearing loss is conductive hearing loss. It can be treated with antibiotics. Now this could lead to mastoiditis. Remember your mastoid bone is right behind the ear. So if you feel that bone, it's kind of pointed uh, right underneath your ear. Um, the infection can spread in the middle ear and extend to the mastoid bone. And that's not good. You'll get an elevated white blood count. You can get a brain abscess because the eyes, the ears, so close to the brain that any inflammation or swelling can also affect the meninges that goes around the brain. So meningitis or even paralysis of facial muscles. Now this could lead to a mastoidectomy due to the ear infection extending to the mastoid bone. So it gets so bad and the, that they need to take that mastoid bone out. Now the nursing care for that would be, uh, wanna take care of the patient's nausea, give them some medication. Always be aware of the hydration. If they have nausea, they could be using losing electrolytes and fluids. So be aware of dehydration. Watch your urine output, the color of the urine. Watch for drainage, drainage from the surgery. Avoid pressure on the tympanic membrane, the blowing of the nose, the sneezing, the straining, bending over, lifting things up that are heavy. That's gonna be a constant theme. Now, otosclerosis. That is a hereditary condition in which abnormal growth causes foot plate of the stapes to become fixed. Now I do have a picture that I, I'm gonna show next, but you also have one on page 1189 that kind of shows what that, remember the, the, the hammer, anvil, the stapes, the incus, the malleus, all of those pieces of the bone, the little, little, um, little tiny bones. And these become fixed and this is otosclerosis, so they sclerose, they fix together. Um, it can occur during pregnancy and progress at a faster rate at that time. Of course, you'd already have to be predisposed to this condition. Now, could have a stapedectomy because it's the stapedes that are fixed. So in this case, the stapes are removed and uh, placed with a prosthesis. Packing is placed in the ear canal, and of course we know only the doctor can remove a packing. But we always want to be aware of any kind of drainage, what color it is, how much it is. Nursing care, the patient should be on bed rest, and they should have some pain relief and prevent infection. So they shouldn't go sticking their finger in their ear or anything else. Vertigo can persist with this uh, mass stapedectomy. And these patients should avoid people with a cold or virus condition. So here's your picture of the otosclerosis before and after the stapedectomy. You can see how it's fixed there. And then we have labyrinthitis. That is the inflammation of the labyrinth of the ear. It may be acute or chronic. It can follow upper respiratory infections. Acute otitis media pneumonia or influenza. It can be affected by some drugs. Um, it's an inner ear infection that usually follows an upper respiratory infection, ear infection or ear surgery. 
The effects can destroy the labyrinth and cochlea, causing permanent deafness. So the signs and symptoms, again, follows an upper respiratory infection. The patient may experience vertigo, nausea, vomiting, a headache, and some hearing loss. A medical treatment, antiemetics, because it's going to make the patient feel nauseous. Antibiotics if there is an infection. Nursing care, you want to be aware because of the vomiting, are they dehydrated? And we're going to check that with skin turgor, mucous membranes. We're going to check their urine, what color is it? We want our patients to be safe because if this causes dizziness, we want to help them out of bed, be sure that they're getting uh, what they need without getting out of bed and losing their balance and falling. Now, this is a big one, Meniere's disease. So Meniere's disease is a disorder of the labyrinth. A lot of people have it. Two million Americans are thought to have attacks of Meniere's disease. The onset's usually between 30 and 60 years old usually only affects one ear. The cause is unknown, but symptoms are related to an accumulation of fluid in the inner ear. That's important to remember because our treatment and our symptoms are gonna be related to this accumulation of fluid. So there are some things that have been found to trigger attacks, and that include alcohol, nicotine, stress, certain stimuli, such as bright lights, or sudden movements of the head. And here I'm thinking like at the fair, going on some of those rides where your head's jerked around, or on a roller coaster. I could see that triggering Meniere's disease. So some signs and symptoms are, um, this, they have acute attacks, that occur at intervals and can last for hours to days. The frequency of attacks can often be reduced with medical treatment. But during these attacks, the symptoms are hearing loss, vertigo accompanied by a pallor, which is a paleness, sweating, nausea, tinnitus, ringing of the ears, accompanies acute attacks, and that can drive you crazy. So vertigo, I want to mention vertigo here. It's a sensation of movement that causes dizziness and nausea. So that's a problem for someone with Meniere's disease. Um, it feels like the room is spinning around and that can make you feel nauseous. Medical diagnosis, it's based on history and physical and have they had hearing loss or any balance problems? When does it come? Come on. When do they have symptoms? Are they doing anything when it occurs? There's also some other tests to detect any neurologic, allergic, or endocrine disorders that may be attached to that. Medical treatment, Valium, because it is related to stress. Valium could be a treatment. Diuretics, if it's an accumulation of fluid. Any drugs to help vertigo like meclizine or scopolamine. A low sodium diet. Now, why do I mention diet here? Low sodium, we know water follows salt. So, sodium is not gonna attract salt. It's not gonna attract, I'm sorry, not gonna attract fluid. So if they stay on a low sodium diet, hopefully the fluid will be less. Diuretics increase the length of time between attacks. Surgical treatments only advised uh, when other measures have failed. But what's the nursing care? Safety is a concern for these patients. Um, my sister-in-law had Meniere's disease. She would go into the room days and week to a week at a time when she'd have an attack. 
Um, it would need to be dark in there, very quiet. She couldn't have movement. So safety is a concern because they do have vertigo. They do feel dizzy, like the room is spinning around. And when they open their eyes, it doesn't help. It doesn't help with their eyes closed or open. It still feels like everything's moving around. And that movement can trigger vomiting. So dehydration can also be a problem. So presbycusis is a term used to describe hearing loss with aging, result of changes in parts of the cochlea. Medical diagnosis and treatment, they may hear well in quiet surroundings. Now this is important to remember. So hearing loss, presbycusis, but the hearing, they can hear well if it's quiet and they hear poorly if it's noisy. What, what, what did you say? Selective deafness, no, not really. It's presbycusis. Nursing care, so be sure if you have a patient who is having trouble hearing, check their hearing aids. Do they have their hearing aids in? Is the battery working? Are they in the right ear? Are they on? Also, the other thing you need to do is practice good listening skills. Read, see if you can read their lips. Watch their mouth move because they should be watching your mouth move too because they're the ones having trouble hearing. But you want to be clear in your wording and mouthing of words because they're having trouble hearing you. Ototoxicity. Now this is an interesting one. It's damage to the ear or eighth cranial nerve caused by specific chemicals, including some drugs. So this is pretty important to know. Damage to Common ototoxic drugs are salicylates like aspirin and aminoglycoside antibiotics like gentamicin. Had a patient also that was on Lasix, high doses of Lasix, and became ototoxic, lost their hearing. So from reversible tinnitus ringing in the ears to permanent hearing loss can be the result. The primary symptoms of the ototoxicity with salicylates is tinnitus, which disappears when the drug is discontinued, thank goodness. But patients who have poor renal function are at special risk for ototoxicity because they are not getting rid of the drug through their kidneys. They're keeping part of the drug. So they can become toxic. Their drugs are excreted more slowly because their kidneys aren't working well. Their renal function is poor. So for nursing care, you wanna monitor the urine output, the color, the amount per hour, and then if you have to, report that to the doctor.